Hey, everybody. Welcome to Startup Basics. It's your host, Jason Calacanis. You know me as the host of This Week in Startups. And... You know, one of the things that we like to do on this program is try to help startups. Like, it's kind of the whole mission of the Launch Festival and This Week in Startups. And I get asked the same questions over and over again. So, I actually had lunch with my good friend here, Todd Carpenter, from Wilson Sonsini, WSGR. And we've known each other for a decade yeah, or so. Uh, a long time working with start startups. And Rachel, you've been uh, at the firm for... Over a decade. Over a decade as well, <laughs> uh, Rachel Profit. And so uh, we just talked about like, hey, what do we do? why don't we do a series where we answer like every question so then we can just send people to that link and at least get them through the basic questions. So that's what we're doing here with Startup Basics. We're like 10 questions out of 20 that we're going to do. Um, and so I asked Rachel and Todd to come and answer one that I have made so many mistakes <laughs> on in my career and gotten bad advice, and now that I'm 20 years into my career, I think I know how to do this right, but this is the question of what type of corporation should I make? Should I make an LLC, an S Corp, or a C Corp? And now there's even this B Corp thing, which I guess we could get into too. But um, let's just start with, if I'm starting a company in Silicon Valley, like it's a tech startup, I'm not talking about building a pizzeria, mm -hmm. you know, or a consulting firm, but if I'm gonna start a tech company, what should I do? S Corp, C Corp, or LLC? Easy short answer is C Corp, right? Delaware C Corp. Now, why? And what is the difference between these three types? So, that is the right answer. And twice in my career, I did an <laughs> LLC and an S Corp because I had like ranky dink attorneys, like mom and pop shops, who were telling me like, "Oh, do LLC, do S, because you're going to get this savings or that savings." But what's the difference between each one? Well, I would I would say to begin with that they may have given you the the right advice for the particular company. I think the 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 point is that. It's very company specific. So okay. you want to set up the right entity for the right corporation that you're, right. or the right company that you're working on for the right business. Um, the biggest difference, if you look at the LLC versus the S Corp versus the C Corp, the LLC and the S Corp are flow through tax entities, which right. means that you can avoid a level of corporate tax. Right. Um, S Corp and a C Corp are largely the same other than the tax treatment and a filing that you need to make with the IRS to elect affirmatively to be an S Corp. Got it. And so if you're doing a mom and pop shop, that's when people tend to do these LLCs or smaller companies. Like, S does S Corp stand for small or no? It's just an election under the tax code. Yeah. It actually means small. It doesn't actually mean small. Because <laughs> right. somebody told me at some point it means small company. I was like, really? No, it doesn't actually mean that. No, and it doesn't have to be a small right. business. Yeah. It could be. It just there are restrictions on what types of shareholders and the number of shareholders that you can have in an S corp. So it, it's prohibitive to do that if you're going to be a Silicon Valley company. Yeah, I mean every single company in Silicon Valley is a C corp, right? I'd say for the most part. I mean, and we end up dealing with a lot of founders that come in and say, "I've been an S corp, I've been an LLC, and I have a term sheet." But one of the conditions to getting funded is, in fact, that we go through a conversion process. So we spend a lot of time counseling folks who probably got advice similar to yours, but yeah. want to be like a normal, look like everyone else C corp. And what is that process like of like actually changing it? It's expensive, isn't it? Can be. We were chatting about this today because we're going through a couple of these with some clients right now. I mean, they can be cost prohibitively expensive sometimes, wow. particularly if you're just running in a seed financing sort of circumstance, right? right. You want to raise fifty thousand, hundred thousand bucks. Like you probably don't want to spend an exorbitant amount of money converting. Yeah. Um, the sooner you do it in your corporate life cycle, the easier, right? There's less contracts to think about, less tax consequences to evaluate. Maybe need less of your accountant's time to figure it out. Um, and they're not impossible, but they can be complicated and expensive. Now, when you want to shut one of these companies down, mm -hmm. what about that process? Because that's something I've had happen as an angel investor, mm -hmm. um, where I was an angel investor in an LLC or in an S Corp or even a C Corp, and then nobody shuts it down and I'm getting notices or somebody says they did shut it down and I'm getting notices. Why is shutting these things down so hard and how does that work? Well, it's largely hard because there are, if you do it properly, there's a lot of statutory procedure that you have to go through to get it done. Uh, and it's largely designed to protect the people, the creditors of the company uh, and the, the jurisdictions in which the companies do business yeah. or are, are formed because there are franchise taxes owed. Mm. So you need to jump through all those hoops of making sure you've paid all your taxes, that you've paid all your creditors. And so there is a, this whole process that you have to go through that's not 
is super challenging. It's just a lot of hoops to jump through. So oftentimes, because there's the, the shield of liability, when these companies are early stage, you'll see entrepreneurs that basically just turn the lights off and walk out. Uh, the problem with that is for years and years to follow, you're going to get notices. these notices from the state. And uh, yeah. if you're the only credible guy that's left standing, uh, it may well come to your address. And that's really frustrating for folks. Yeah, that has been frustrating for me. <laughs> like literally, I had some things where we sold companies to AOL or whatever. And I'm still getting these things. And I'm like, can we just shut this down? And then I wind up having to pay a small fee, but whatever, mm -hmm. to finally shut them and just to stop getting uh, the mail. Let's talk about the B Corp because I invested in one. Hand Up um, is a great uh, company that we invested in that is helping homeless people by building profiles of them on the web where they can uh, basically communicate and what they need in their life, whether mm -hmm. it's dentures or a place to live, and then get donators and serial donators who give a little bit each month. It's really working wonderfully, but it's a B Corporation. Mm -hmm. And this, to me, as an investor, I had a really hard time trying to even figure out what this mm -hmm. is because I'm investing, but it's not a nonprofit, so they make a profit, but there's a benefit. So what is this? It's interesting you say that. You're probably on the cutting edge of investors willing to entertain this yeah. for exactly that reason. So it's been around for a little while. Yeah. I think adoption rates have been low for exactly that reason because you know the, the principle is set out in many jurisdictions to allow a public benefit corporation, which basically means – Companies get to focus on something in addition to just the bottom line, right? right? It may not necessarily be just to maximize profit. We may also want to do good in the community and the, for the environment, you know, some yeah. other ulterior, hopefully better purpose. Right. Depending on who you talk to, this could be the sort of next wave of capitalism. And wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone right. sort of dedicated a, to a greater, grander purpose to make this world in which we live better? Um, but I think there's been a little bit of question mark in investors' minds, particularly VCs, because it kind of blurs the question mark, what's my fiduciary duty and how am I going to relate to this company and how do I think about this? Yeah. Um, but I, I think, again, to true to you yourself, you're sort of a trendsetter in the fact that you've already invested in one. Yeah. They're not very popular yet. They're not popular, um, but I have to say amongst Generation Y mm -hmm. and young people, they don't want to go to work just for the bottom line. It's That's not very true. motivating for them. It's very true. And so the way I got myself through it was like, if young people are going to go to work to create something amazing, and this makes them want to come to work more or be more entrepreneurial because they feel like their company is aligned with a goal. And in Hand Up's case, it's getting people out of poverty and getting people out of homelessness and sustainably getting them out of there. Mm -hmm. Then I guess, you know, I have to try at least. So I've done one. Um, but what do, you, what do you think of this, Todd? Are you, you know, seeing I, it now or just I, discussions about I, it? I get the question every once in a while, and yeah. I think that it's a really great idea. I When I think about it, I, I feel like it's very similar to some of the new um, securities that we're seeing in the market. So whether it's the Y Combinator Safe or the convertible security, yeah. these things are really good ideas. And I think they've got an a, a important role to play in the ecosystem. Um, but if you're a first-time entrepreneur trying to get a company funded, you just don't want to have to spend the cycles trying to explain either a new security or a new type of entity to the investor. Like your your core focus really should be on your business and getting funding and then getting back to you know, nose down and focused on building your business. So I, I think that's the challenge is that it, it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with these things. Hmm. Um, it's just another hoop to jump through and a difficulty with investors. As you said, you had to get over it yourself and, yeah. and you're a pretty liberal guy. So I think going to someone on Sand Hill and, and try to explain that and then have them turn around and explain it to their partnership. It's not going to happen. And you just don't want that experience. additional question. Yeah. You know, in five or 10 years, maybe it'll be uh, the standard, the norm. And, and you know, there are these great benefits to it. And I think we all agree that it would be something, it'd be great for capitalism and for uh, society. Uh, but I think we've got a little bit to go before they're mainstream. And I think the good news is, is you don't have to start there. You can convert in. So if you Later. happen to get exactly, yeah. so if you happen to get a lot of credibility and the and the business is going great, and you want to give your employees an extra incentive and get your VC board on board with it, yeah. you can always convert later. But there's really nothing. I I couldn't find, at least in my research, that there was anything clear about like what that mission statement means. It's just that there is a mission, and Absolutely. that mission can change. Mm -hmm. So uh, my question was like, well, what's the difference if we did a C Corp and just said, this is our mission and a B Corp and this is our mission. What's the difference? 
I think it's creating an actual um, sort of public statement that we're going to be accountable, right? Ah. Because depending on the jurisdiction you're in, and I believe California is one of these, that if you elect to be a public benefit corporation, mm-hmm. you have to, I think it's every other year, report to your mm-hmm. constituencies, how are you doing against your mission that Got you've it. publicly declared versus I'm a C-Corp, you can make a statement and you may never talk about it again and you have no obligation to do so. Got it. Got it. So it's very interesting. And you know what's interesting is um, the point you bring up, Todd, of Gosh, you don't really want to complicate things Mm -hmm. when you're dealing with people who are very busy, i.e. venture capitalists, and who, let's face it, like they don't, they have a system for doing something and they have signaling. So when I did Weblogs Inc., which was the second company I ever did, I had an LLC because I was advised, you know, by like a single practitioner to do this. And I had Yossi Vardy, one of the most famous investors in the world from Israel. And he's like, Jason... Or rather, Jason, I can't do this LLC <laughs> and I have the taxes in the United States and I can't do this. And so I had to like not have Yossi as an investor. I lost Yossi as an investor, which was great for Mark Cuban, who said, I'll take Yossi's piece. <laughs> and Mark Cuban took it all, which was brilliant and got a 15x return in one year, which is why, hey, me and Mark get <laughs> but along now, great. Right. <laughs> but he actually, you know, it's, if you make a billionaire a million dollars, it doesn't really matter. But it was fun to win together, which is really what he's about. But gosh, did I have that exact experience, Todd. There's a really good salient point, which is you you have to go with the flow. Yeah. And if they see something odd, a lot of VCs will just be like, you know what? It's odd. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a red flag. Let's just move on. Because they're kind of looking it. for reasons to ding stuff, I think. Well, yeah. And they're, they're very much pattern recognition focused yeah. because they have to be. I mean, think about the number of business plans that flow over these folks' mm-hmm. desks. And there needs to be ways to sort through that. So if there is an added hurdle to get over, it's just more of a challenge. Um, like I said in the beginning, there are good reasons to structure an entity as an LLC. Sure. And a lot of really smart private equity funds require that. It's, yeah. it's flipped on its head. Um, mm-hmm. But for VCs, there are tax reasons and their limited partners uh, prohibit them from doing it. Yep. Even then, if you're the right LLC, they can set up what's called a blocker corporation. Uh, and, and, the, and it can work. It's just hard. It's hard yeah. to convince them. And given the number of startups you're competing with for capital these days, mm-hmm. um, I just don't see a good reason to limit your, your options and make it harder for yourself. Yeah, I 100% agree. It matches my, my painful experience. <laughs> now, what about when do you form the corporation? Because mm-hmm. I can tell you, you know, through the hackathons, and we have mm-hmm. these companies that magically start at the hackathons, a number of which I send to uh, Wilson Sonsini, and you take very good care of. Thank you. Um, we appreciate it. Well, you know, it's a, it's actually really nice because I get to send them to like the best firm and they're like two, you know, two people who made something a week. And I'm like, by the way, here's like the best firm that's, you know, not cheap and like they're going to be the best. And you guys actually take very good care of them because you have the tiny office here now, like in Soma, you have like a small office where we you do. Yeah. specialize in sort of doing it, which is kind of like a really smart move on your part. But when do you incorporate? Because now I have, we've had this situation, I should say us because we dealt with this, four people in a hackathon, mm-hmm. two people don't want to continue. Two people do want to make it into a company. They built something. There's some intellectual property that gets built over 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And then do you incorporate before the hackathon, after the hackathon, a month later? When should you decide to actually incorporate? We were just chatting about this over lunch, and I think you're going to get various schools of thought. But I think you highlighted all the points, right? When there's probably more than one of you, you Mm -hmm. need to figure out who owns what and how that ownership is going to work over time. When there's something created, right, when you've got IP to protect it's best that that's in the company, right, for the very reason you cited. If it's not in the company and people want to part ways, you're going to have a battle to resolve of yeah. where does the where does the IP go. And let's remind ourselves the reason we're talking about entity structure to begin with is also from a liability perspective, right? Ah. And the moment you start to put yourself in a situation where you could incur liability, i.e. you're going to sign a contract with someone, you're going to agree to pay someone, you're going to you know sign a lease. Put a product in the world. Exactly, yeah. right? You want to want some sort of shield between the rest of the world and yourself personally. Okay. So those are your triggers. Intellectual property, more than one person working on it, and the possibility of personally being liable for the fact that you yeah. put, you know, whatever, a, a ride-sharing exactly. company out there where somebody gets, you know, killed in an accident, God forbid, or gets mm-hmm. hit by a ride-sharing car. You, you don't want to have that personal liability. Absolutely. Anything else? Uh, yeah, well, I tell a lot of folks that um, it's when you feel like you have something important enough to protect. Mm-hmm. And I, I say reflect on what you're doing. And if you're making a decision to use your resources, whether it's your time or your capital. Um, so if you're quitting your job, 
you feel pretty strongly <laughs> about this company. Yeah, there's a pretty good so indicator. You <laughs> should probably point. protect it, and you should yeah. make sure that the IP is assigned to a corporation and that you've got a liability shield. Yeah. If you're willing to pay several thousand dollars to incorporate, then mm. that's the right time to do it. Um, yeah. If it's just a weekend hobby with you and a couple of buddies and you're hacking on things and trying to brainstorm, mm. uh, that's probably too early. You can save the money. Um, but once you really start building a product yeah. and, and feel strongly and you're committing some resources to it, it's not that expensive and it's protective of everyone. So I think the earlier the better. Yeah. And nowadays there's a lot of uh, tools out there to mm -hmm. get you, you know, we do fixed fee formation packages. You've yeah, got absolutely. Clerky. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to be it's, it's so not, expensive. Like just thinking 10, 20 years ago, absolutely. like just the idea of going to a big firm and doing it, but it's gotten so much easier. Absolutely. You know, and simpler mm -hmm. um, to just do that. Well, and then going back again about in entity structures in which you would choose, we can do a, a Delaware C Corp in an afternoon, and it's very yeah. cost effective. An LLC is a contract based uh, situation, so every one of the LLC agreements is uniquely crafted for that entity. Yeah. Yes, you can pull something off the shelf, but it probably <laughs> won't work perfectly. So right. um, it's much more expensive to set up as an LLC. So if you want to do it quickly, cheaply, uh, again, another reason to, to choose the C Corp. All right, listen, Rachel Prophet, Todd Carpenter, Wilson Sincini, you know the firm, WSGR. Um, thanks so much for just giving great, honest, simple advice. And listen, I've made this mistake. Don't be an idiot. Do it right. <laughs> and I, what I always tell people, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Absolutely. That's the advice I give you. If, you're, if it's worth doing, like you're saying, Todd, like if you're quitting your job, so if it's worth doing, do it right. Be buttoned up and uh, yeah, don't, don't cause problems for yourself in the future. All right, we'll see you next time on Startup Basics. Thanks.